Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Pastor Greg's lesson today is in Luke chapter 18, titled, Legacy Up. There you go. Russ County, Texas. Little, little county in East Texas over here. <clears throat> Anybody ever been there? All right, a few people. Well, back in 1834, I remember it well, um, a guy named J.W. Krim in, in 1834 settled that area, and he donated some land for an early church there, and it was called Krim's Chapel Baptist Church. Anybody been there? Anybody seen it? My wife's the only one raising her hand. And it operated there from uh, 1834 until today, and it started way back in the day. J.W. Krim and his namesake is still there. It's located in the middle of nowhere, and no one, uh, even just about to this day, is, uh, it's just rural, nowhere, county farm, agricultural, nowhere. And that church got started by this guy who donated the land, and things got started, and here's some 150, is that right, 150, 1830, something like that years later. It's still going on, but like the Crims Chapel Baptist Church, every church has a beginning, and it starts with the people of God uh, having a yearning and a desire to meet together. And here's a picture of the Crim family, supposedly from the Internet, says that this is them. And uh, way back in the day, they built a, they built a little white church, and then they built a, later on, uh, they built a concrete church or a brick church, and I'll show that to you a little bit later on. But what happens is, is the church, sometimes we just get caught up in the church of now, what's happening, but, but we, can, we can learn and we can get something out of understanding how God works in the church. And the way it starts off is everyday people live out what is known as the Great Confession, and we're going to read about that in just a second. The Great Confession is, is this. It is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 18 here. We'll read it now. Um, Jesus was talking to his disciples. He had already had a conversation with them, and Jesus said this. He said, who, before, before the passage on the screen, he said, who are the people, uh, what are the people saying? Who are they saying that I am? And they, he gave some answers. And then he asked the harder question, and it's the most important question, and it's a good question for you. What about you? Who do you say that I am? That's the most important question of your life. Who do you think that Jesus is? Do you think he's who he says he is, or do you think he's something else? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, you're exactly who you say you are. You're the one that's been promised. I've seen your miracles. I know that you are the, the way of salvation. He's saying all this in this one little sentence. He's saying, Jesus, you're who you say you are. You are the Christ. You are the promised one. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, Simon, and then Peter, which in Greek means rock. He says, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The first thing we, I want to notice in verse 17 is that, that Peter's salvation and Peter's proclamation of, of this, great, uh, this great truth, it says it's not of himself. It's a revelation of God. You know, suddenly we get caught up in our, in our Christian walk and maybe be a little proud of ourselves that we could trace it back to a point where we didn't know anything, where there was no way, and God made a way through the Word of God through His precious Son, so that we could each come to know Him. There's no boasting allowed in the Christian faith other than boasting in Christ. And so this great confession, the confession that I believe Jesus is who He is, we're going to talk about that as a foundation and how it fits in and how it works within the church. Looking here again, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're exactly who you say you are. I've seen your miracles. I've seen who you are, and I believe that. And it comes from a faith that acknowledges that he is who he says he is. 
And he's always been that. Even when I didn't believe he was still the Lord of Lords. When I had no interest, he was still the King of Kings. When I proverbially tried to push him aside out of my life, he was still the loving, kind Father. And we acknowledge that, and that's the great confession that churches and lives are built on. And then he goes on to say, Jesus says that upon this rock, upon this true confession of who Jesus, who I am, Jesus makes this incredible statement. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is the church builder. He's in the business of building up a church, and he also says that it will not fail. Now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some hits. If you study church history at all, you see the church got dark for a good while. It, it, got, it got off course of the main thing of, of the true confession of Jesus, and it got into a bunch of other stuff, and every church kind of does that from time to time. But he guarantees an ultimate victory. It gets beat up. The church gets pushed around. It gets split up sometimes and launched about. But church building is what Jesus does. I got to thinking about, about the church, and Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. And the question is, is he building his church? Has he built his church? Well, I dare say to you that he has, and he is. His word, it, uh, it never fails. So I went, I went to the Internet, and I asked myself this question. I said, how many churches, I wonder, are there, Christian churches? And so I found this website. I did a bunch of research on my own, and I found this website called thecompletepilgrim.com. And so you know that's got to be pretty good information. It's not just the average pilgrim. But it's thecompletepilgrim.com. And, and they said there were between eight and 16 million church buildings in the world that are affiliated with Christianity. Now, Quora.com had a little bit bigger number, and they said somewhere between um, up to 37 million different church buildings that have Christianity at their, uh, at least a part of who they are. So when we sit here, we're, we're not doing this church thing alone. All over the world, Jesus is fulfilling his promise to say, I'm going to build my church. And in places there are no buildings, guess what? The church still meets. The church is still being built up. Communist countries, places where they won't allow churches. And the church still exists. Between 8 and 37 million, you pick a number, whichever one you like the best. But today's episode of the church, by the way, is for you. This exact makeup of congregation the exact baggage you bring into this, this worship time, the exact circumstances you've been through, the amount of praise and thankfulness you have to give to God, it'll never be matched again. It's a one-time thing. And God does miracles and works through His church because He said, I'm not going to let it fall away. I'm not going to let it blow up. I'm not going to let it go away. And He does it with or without church buildings, but He always does it through people because he builds his church on the confession that we say Jesus is who he says he is. And the truly, Christ, the truly Christian church has this great confession as their basis. And they always come back to it. When they veer away, they come back and they say, man, we've got to get back to Jesus. It's always been him. It always will be him. And it needs to be him right now. And it's their baseline teaching. And it's our baseline doctrine. And I think about that church I mentioned, Crim's Chapel, at its beginning, uh, you know, the, it wasn't even the beginning of that church because God had moved in the hearts and lives of people before that to bring Mr. Crim to a point of knowing him. And so we come to this idea that great confession has to be made by each one individually. It can't be passed down from, from, from generation to generation. In 2 Timothy, Paul talk, is talking to Timothy and he says he says this I've been reminded of your sincere faith faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice and now I'm persuaded it's also living in you and so Paul's talking about the heritage of the faith but it lived in one but it's not transferred through the DNA it's transferred through the living word of God and 
and he indicates at least that these ladies, one lady raised another lady in, in the good news of who God was and Jesus was and passed it down by word and by deed. But it's always the word of God. Your lifestyle makes a big difference in people's lives, but it's the word of God in speech, in print, and that changes people's lives. And it also says that the faith needs to be sincere. You know, sometimes we can get so busy with life that we got a plan, and maybe even we feel like God led us to this plan, but, but then Jesus becomes like an add-on. He was once at the very center of our lives. He, everything revolved around him, and then he, he gave us this vision for this good plan, and as we moved forward, he kind of got pushed onto the baggage car. He's just kind of hooked up in the trunk somewhere. It's like he's a good thing to have, but that's not, that's not where God's going to stay in your life if you're a believer. He needs to be at the center of your life, not an additive. And people are drawn to sincerity. When they see a true, truly changed life, it's something that people cannot argue against if we're going to be the light of the world. Now, I mentioned this church in Crim's Chapel. It was formed in 1883 up in Rusk County. Um, about 150 years after its creation, uh, at Crim's Chapel, I became a staff member on that church. That's how come I know about that little church in East Texas. It was my very first job as a youth director. I sang in my first adult cantata there with about nine other people, as I remember. We sang a, song, we sang a, a cantata called Joseph the Carpenter. And I think there were 12 or, 12 or so of us in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the choir loft, and there were probably just a few more than that in the pews out there. And it looks like this. There's, it is still there today, First Baptist Church of Crim's Chapel. Um, it's nothing really to look at. And I remember a couple of events, do you, and, and I'm not just trying to walk down memory lane for my sake, but if you look back at your church experience, hopefully you're dropping in and saying, I remember stuff at churches that, that God was doing. But I remember little Misty Stevens, who was six years old, sang a song called Kids Under Construction. Anybody remember that song? The words are, kids under construction, maybe the paint is still wet. Kids under construction, the Lord might not be finished yet. And this little six-year-old sang that, and I remember it to this day, and it was, it was a meaningful moment in my worship. I mean, it wasn't the only one, but it's, it was probably one of the stranger ones, so I remember it. But God, God's using events like that to build His church. While I was there, they built, a, here's the inside of it, they, they built a youth building while I was there, which was uh, kind of pretty cool since I was the youth director. And it hold, we had brand 60 or 80 or so. But their long-standing commitment to the gospel and who Jesus was allowed this church to, to flourish and endure. Now, they've been very small, as many as 20 or 30 sometimes. And while we were there, we got up over 100 for, for a little bit. But people had a heart for teens, and they couldn't reach into those teens' lives well enough, so they hired a guy like me in college, no experience, my first ever church experience. And being the spiritual guy I was at that point in my life, my greatest qualification that they, I found out later why they hired me, we had, we had several good resumes, but you were married. So... Wearing a wedding ring was like my number one qualification. They didn't want to hire some young college, college guy to, to, to take care of their youth. Uh, and so the Lord opened up doors, and they had a heart for teams, and then they, they, they hired me, and I'm sure that I got way more out of the experience than they did. But God was working in that church, and he set that church up when I needed a place to go to learn, to grow. That church was there for me. Can you look back? It's your church life and, and see a church that was there for you when they needed them. It may have been a one-shot deal. Some of you, we get a lot of guests here. We got a lot of one-shot deals here. People come in. We, share, we try to share the good news. We, we hope and pray for the best. Trust that God will use it. But I hope, I hope you're tracking with your history if you have one in that way. But just a few counties over, there's another church that started some 50 years, uh, and it was in this Henderson County Texas, and it was the First Baptist Church of Malakoff. It was formed in 1883 by, and I love this name, <clears throat> the Reverend Hezekiah Mitchum. 
You could just you could just say that. And now the Reverend Hezekiah Mitchum, and and he and he he formed what became the church here, it was my first church ever full time, and it and it happened back in 1880. The St. Louis and the Southern Railroad came through the, this city of Malakoff, Texas, and that's when the church was formed. People began to come to this little rural area, and all of a sudden it came up, and, and this church was there. And when I needed my first full-time church, they needed a guy who do youth and music, and the Lord brought us together in a miraculous way. But, you know, you're saying, well, that's special for you, like pastor stuff. It's not that way. It's not just for pastors. God miraculously works in the lives of everyone because he loves the church. He's building up the church. He's calling people into the church, and he's using the church to change the world. One of the most unlikely ways I can think of, because the church is messed up, people. It is. We're, just, we're a bunch of messed up people with messed up pastors who veer off the course. But when we come back to Jesus, we find the right way, and we complete his mission for the church. So about two years after I took my first full-time church, there's another county in Texas way down here at the bottom that you're sitting in. The Island Baptist Church was formed in 1984. So right about the time I'm taking my first church way back early in my ministry, this church is formed. We've got a handful of people are meeting up here in a, uh, in a hotel ballroom or a classroom or something. And they say, hey, we need a church on the island. And there wasn't much here at that point, I understand. No not high rises, just a bunch of sand. But they said, we need a presence here. And my point is that, that, that God's design, he's working ahead of everything that you've got going on. He's worked way behind to prepare people and churches and places in your life so that we could come together and celebrate the church of Jesus Christ. It's also called the bride of Christ. It's his love. It's an imperfect and sometimes ugly bride, but he loves the church. And he promised that he would keep building it up. And so with the number of churches we've talked about, my stories, my couple little insignificant stories, are repeated thousands and thousands of times in, in the same in your life, the church that was there for you. And then you were there as the church for someone else. It's multiplied over and over again. And then the church, the church comes down to this church where we um, ended up, this is a picture from last week, we don't have a congregation that could reach the whole spring break crowd, but what does God do? He brings in a group like Beach Reach. <laughs> they hired me as a youth director to reach kids they couldn't. We incorporate and participate with them to reach, what was the, what, Jeff, what was that number of, of uh, salvations that we had on that screen I meant to put up and I didn't get it up there? Look it up for me, would you? Put them to work there. Anybody remember the number of salvations the second week? Jeff will get it for me in a second. 171 salvations. And they, yeah. And it's, it is through, and, it's, and we don't get any credit, but, but it's through our church. It's because God set all this up, and he, he's working ahead in the church because he loves the church. Did, did you get the point about the church? It's kind of a big deal to God. And it's not because I'm a pastor of a church. It's just because it's a big deal to God. And about 20 years into this church, then I show up here, Pastor Bill, and at roughly the same time. And then you're here today, and you get a little bit of something that the church has to offer, which is taking you to the Word of God, taking you to the feet of Jesus and saying, we got to keep Jesus in our life. So how does that happen? How does all that process happen? Well, it happens... By us holding fast. Here we have in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, it says, Let's hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. It's keeping the main thing the main thing. Our confession is that Jesus is who he said he is, and therefore we owe our lives to him and we owe our eternity to him, and we gladly, we gladly serve him and push his causes forward so that other people might come along with us. So we hold fast to this confession of hope, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how we can stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, 
as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day of Christ coming, the day of us going to heaven, the day of all that being completed. But our job is to stir one another up. What does that mean? It means, it means we need to keep each other churned up and moving in the right direction. It's not, now, some of you guys are good at stirring people up. And maybe that's not a good thing. You know how to push buttons. But our job is to stir each other up toward good works, toward the main thing. And we start to veer away. We start to get all involved and get our, uh, ourselves upset over things that are minor and trivial. And in one another, we need to bring each other back to the main thing, which is Jesus. It's serving Him. It's knowing Him. It's proclaiming His name. The great confession every church has as its basis the true confession that Jesus is the Lord. He's the one and only way to heaven. He's the light. He's the truth. He's everything He said He is. And despite all the, the, the bad history in church and maybe your bad history in the church, God is constantly revitalizing the church through its people to come back to the Word, to come back to the Lord, to come back to the purpose, which is to evangelize and honor God. And it takes a steadiness. We've got to hold fast to these things. Hold fast to the truth and not be, be swept away by every other teaching, but always come back to the main thing. So as you look back at your church history as the people who were there for you, uh, even including if this is your first time ever in church, you can look back to a history and say, wow, people... We're responding to God, and that's why this church is here now. And we had people who were steady, and people with sound mind and doctrine. And sure, all those churches fluctuated up and down, good and bad, off the course, and came back to the good word. Like Mr. Krim and like Hezekiah Mitchum, they did four things that I want to challenge us to do as a church. First of all, uh, they made the good confession, so that makes it five. They came to know Jesus, and at some point, by the leadership of God, these people, they prayed the way for a church to start. They were excited about, about the possibility of a church on the island, a church in the cornfield, a church out in the middle of nowhere for the few people who were there. And they prayed about that, and they tried to follow God's leadership. Secondly, they paid the way. The offering's over, so this is not about trying to get you to give more. But they paid the way. They reached in their pockets and they said, we'll donate the land. Well, I'll, we got to, somebody's got to pay the electric bill or whatever. And people paid all these years so that you could have an experience all along your church history. And we're doing the same thing. Just by our presence, by a church that stay, stands firm in the world, word, we make a way, we pay the way, and we pave the way with our, with our work, with the way we treat one another, with the way we encourage one another, the way we love one another. And then lastly, a healthy church that continues to move on as it corrects itself on its journey will always engage the fray. Now, I did that because it rhymes. It paid, prayed the way, paid the way, paved the way, engaged the fray. It's like, oh, that, that rhymes. I'll throw that in there. It's not very good, but it rhymes. But I began to think about the word, and that's exactly what happens. We have the fray are people that just don't quite think like us, and they don't they aren't like us in many ways. And we need to engage them with the good news of the gospel. Not to try to get their, them to change their opinions on, on stuff that's not in the Bible. We need to engage them with who Jesus is and give them opportunities to make the good confession and say, yes, I believe he is exactly who he said he is. So I look back at I look back at, at, at my career and I kind of walked you through that. But before that, I was just I was just a regular guy in church, and right now, pretty much other than like, stuff I do up here, I'm just a regular guy in church. I'm trying to do the same things that you you were supposed to be doing, to share the light. But it didn't start with uh, with my home church. I just kind of showed up and it was there. You know, I was I ran the same church from about three years old to about seventeen or eighteen years old. Never thought about where it came from. Yesterday. I thought, I'm going to find out what the history of my church is, because I have no idea. Was this started in 1850? Some of the highlights were that some disgruntled church member at some point got mad and burned it down. They rebuilt it at a different location, 
a tornado blew it down. Then they, they got to the point in sometime in early 1930s, I think it was, they were down to 10 members. They were meeting in what ended up being my, the junior high school that I went, I went to sometime in the 30s. And they were down to 10 people, and, and they met together. And one of the guys said, I vote that we disband this church. They were at the bottom of wherever. And the pastor said, I will not allow a vote to disband this. You can leave, but we are not going to dissolve this Baptist church. And so five of the ten left the church, and they were down to five people. And they bought a cornfield. And people said, you all are just crazy people. And it was in the middle, the middle of nowhere, in the middle of no one. And that area grew up, and that became the church that ministered to me. For many years. Now, I, now I, I, there was a time in my life when I completely disregarded some of the things they were teaching. Like, oh, that ain't right. I got a life to live. But they were there placing the foundation. Because these people were faithful all the way back. Through all their trials and all their troubles. It's amazing as I look back how, God, how God's worked. And, and you may never do any research on the history of the churches you've been to, and that's all fine and good. But know this, that you can trace it back to Jesus. Because Jesus said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Gates of hell, not going to prevail. They're not going to win. Not going to win. And God is at work. When we make the great confession, it moves us to the great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And so we can't just, if once the church begins to focus inward all the time, then, then it begins to go off the rails. So we focus on the great confession. We focus on the great commission. And we live it out, and we have a spiritual legacy that we can then pass on to other people. I tell you these stories, why? Because they're fun stories? Well, they are to me. I don't know if they are to you. But I hope that you're seeing yourself in a journey, that God has placed the church in your life at just the right time. And some of the church hurt you have, He placed that in your life so that you know what not to be. There's that guy, and he did this, and the church did that. And I'm not going to be a part of that kind of stuff. And you learn and you grew. But he's growing his church. I'm going to end with this one last story. So I was at a, uh, <clears throat> I was at the Second Baptist Church of Granite City for one of one of my my uh, my ten years as as a pastor. I was the worship and uh, worship and counseling pastor. It was the first time I moved out of youth ministry at this little church. And there was a lady in the church, and and shame on me, I don't remember her name. She sat in my choir, and. Uh, she just was a little old frail lady and loved to sing and praise the Lord. And here's a picture of the inside. And she sat right over on this edge over here. And then the, after, after every time we, uh, we sang and the, and the choir finished the, the song service, she would come down. And as I remember, if my memory serves me correct, she sat right over here. And one day she said to me, she said, Greg, I, I know you love music. I have an accordion I'd like for you to see. And quite honestly, the accordion is not like one of my favorite instruments ever. I actually almost looked for accordion sound today just to bring that in, but I couldn't find one. So anyway, the accordion is, accordion is kind of a cool instrument, but it's like I didn't know how to play it. So she brought it over, and uh, she couldn't even drag it out from under the bed, and I helped her, and she put it on the bed, and then she said, oh, play it. So I tried to play it, and I could play one hand. The other hand's got a, like a thousand buttons. I don't know what they do. So I just play, and, you know, like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. She said, would you like to have it? And I'm saying, you know, I, I can't take your accordion. She said, no, I really, really want you to have it. She said, but one thing I want to, I want to ask you don't just sell it. Don't, don't just sell the accordion. Because it was an expensive one. I think it was, I best guess was around, uh, she paid like eight or 900 bucks for it way back then. And so it was a nice one, maybe, maybe even more. So I, at her bidding, I agreed. I took the accordion. We took it home. I played it once. 
put it in a box. I probably picked it up one more time. My kids, when they were growing up, found it in the corner. They pulled it out of the box, and, you know, they're trying to play that big old heavy thing, and it said in the box. We moved from that church to, uh, to our next church, and it went in the corner of the basement. And then somewhere along the way, I'm not sure, between my mom, our, our youth director who was, who was from Romania, or some other missionary, there's some combination of those people. It came to light while my mom and dad were visiting me in Georgia, and they said, we were talking with this, this missionary, and he's going to Romania, and they need an accordion. And I said, well, guess what? Guess what? I have one. And they're like, what? Yes, I do. It's stuck that. We went and dug it out. They drug it from Georgia, hopped on a plane with it, with all their other suitcase. They were really happy about that extra. But they were ha- actually really were happy to do it, but it was kind of hard. So they took it back to St. Louis, gave it to somebody who gave it to somebody else. And last I heard, it made it to Romania, and they were happy with it. Now, I can't wait to get to heaven and find out how long that thing lasted. You know, if it's still going over there or if it lasted a week. But, but the cool thing about that story is, is, is that while, yeah, that's a, one, that's a one-off thing, but that's our God. He's orchestrating people who are doing what they can with what they have, and he makes it more than what it could ever be on its own. Because he's building people, and he's building his church. What about your faithfulness? What will your being faithful to God look like, and what will that do for others? Well, like the accordion, I think I bet most of the stuff you won't really know how much of an impact it is till you get to heaven, and that's got to be okay. This side of heaven, you won't know, but you can know this: that you can trust the one who saved you, and trust the one that moves you to do ministry, and your faithfulness to Him, your faithfulness to His work, will never come back empty. Never. The great confession, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Is that your confession? That's my biggest concern today for you. Is that your confession? You believe Jesus is who he said he is? And if that's the case, he's using you and he's building his church. And he promises that victory will be at hand. We make the great confession. We prioritize the church that Jesus loves, and he promises he's going to build it up. And we'll be leaving a great legacy that pleases the Lord. He, Jesus, is in the church building business. He builds hearts. He builds lives. He builds congregations. He calls you to be a part of that. We're in the faithfulness business. We be faithful to walk with him, to keep his word at the center of our lives, and to show our love and faithfulness to him. So will you say with me, Yes, I'll be faithful to the Savior and to His church. I hope that's your heart this morning. Pray with me if you would. God, we are grateful for Your Word. We are grateful for Your church and how, Lord, You've promised that You're going to bless it and You're going to make it work. And God, I thank You for the lives that are touched today, both here, online, every other way we, we participate. God, we're thankful that, that the work we do doesn't come back empty and that we don't have to see it or know it. But God, we can trust you. I pray especially for those who've yet to make this great confession that you will open their eyes and their hearts and their ears to say, yes, I believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. He died. He came back to life. He did miracles. He is the one and only way. I pray that you open people's hearts to that this morning. Guide us as we have this time of invitation that we might all say yes to whatever you have. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.